Father God, Lord, we just pray that your presence be abound in this room. Father God, we pray that your spirit move in this room. Lord, this is your word. This is your word. I'm simply a vessel communicating your word, so I pray that you have your way. Lord, I pray that everyone in the audience today has ears to hear, minds to comprehend, and hearts to receive. And Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this glorious day. We thank you for the fact that we could all meet here today, right now, so that you can do a work. All glory be to you, Jesus. And we pray these things in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Today, we are going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 3. The Gospel of John, chapter 3. I'm going to be reading from the New King James. If you have a different version, follow along. It's going to line up mostly. And uh, we're going to go from there. All right. John, chapter 3. I love this chapter. It is tied for all the other chapters in the Bible as my favorite. And so there's a stiff competition going on. But John chapter three is probably one of my favorites for several reasons. We get to meet someone named Nicodemus, who I'm gonna explain a little bit more about in a moment. And then we have this beautiful conversation that Nicodemus had with Jesus. And Jesus was explaining things to Nicodemus about the greater things of God. And so you have on one hand, God made flesh trying to communicate as simply as possible to a man who has dedicated his entire life to studying scripture. And so there's this disconnect in there. And so it's a beautiful picture. Um, Jesus explains a couple of things. Number one, what it means to be born again, which we're going to cover. And number two, what it means to be born again in the spirit specifically. Um, there's being born of this well, water and then the spirit. And so we're going to cover both of those today as well. So let's read. I'm just going to exist in verses 1 through 21. I'm going to read them in their entirety first. And then we're going to go back and unpack them bit by bit, piece by piece. So John chapter 3. Let's do it. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, We speak what we know and testify to what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who has come down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, this is the one that everybody can quote probably inside and out, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Last piece. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. That's a big fear. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, and that they have been done in God. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's first talk about Nicodemus. 
Nicodemus was a Pharisee. There's a few things we know about Nicodemus right off the bat. Number one, we know he was rich. We know he was a very successful man with a lot of finances. We're going to see Nicodemus after this conversation later in the Gospels. After Jesus was crucified and they were quickly getting him off the cross to put him in a tomb before Shabbat, before sundown of Sabbath, uh, Nicodemus and Joseph uh, and another Joseph showed up to get him and get him in the tomb quickly. And Nicodemus paid for all the spices and he paid a lot of money to get Jesus into a tomb quickly. And so we know right away, also being a person of his stature and authority, he also benefited greatly from the tithes that were offered to the church. Number two, we know that Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. It says it right there in the scripture, which means he was one of the 70 Sanhedrin. So just a quick little hierarchy. So you have the Israelite nation, you have the Israelite people, you have rabbis that are called teachers, right? That's what rabbi is. Rabbi is a teacher. And the teachers of the teachers was this group of men called the Sanhedrin, right? They were the teachers of the teachers. And then you had Caiaphas, who was the high priest at the time. And so Nicodemus was not only a rabbi, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a teacher of teachers. And so he was a man of a ruler stature, so to speak. And number three, we know that he was very religious. That's what Pharisees are, right? We had the scribes whose jobs was, was to interpret the law. So they would constantly scour through Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament. They would go through it. The scribes would interpret the law. And it was the Pharisees' jobs to enforce the law. So these guys, their whole existence was to go around and make sure that every single little minute detail of scripture and law was followed. And if you were out of line, they let you know about it. So he was very much a letter of the law kind of guy. Super successful and wealthy, a ruler amongst the head of the people. And then three, he was a Pharisee, which meant he followed the law and was very religious. So there's about 6,000 men uh, who in, who gave their life to codifying and, and giving it over to the law, and he was amongst them. So now in verse one, that's where we see ruler of the Jews. So we know that Nicodemus did that. Now, if you look at verse one, it says Nicodemus came by night. And in my studies, um, my first thought when I first started reading this, as many of you have probably thought, well, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? One school of thought is that because Jesus was such a controversial figure and because Nicodemus was, such a, was a person of such high status that he met him at night in secret so that it wouldn't be you know, front page news. It was, he couldn't be seen associating with Jesus because he was, remember, he was called a rebel rouser and a troublemaker. This could be true. But another school of thought is the fact that this was also the time of Passover. And remember, Nicodemus, being a member of the Sanhedrin, was a very busy man this time of year. So his day was probably spent teaching, edifying, and lifting up the, the Israelite church. And also, you know, during that time, here we are in Florida, it's summer, right? What do we have the blessing of besides fans that they didn't have back then? Air conditioning, right? So meeting in the evenings was a common thing back then. A lot of these houses back in the day in Jesus' time had flat roofs with narrow staircases because it was very common for people to meet in the evening hours because it was a cooler part of the day. And so the fact that Nicodemus met Jesus at night doesn't necessarily lend itself to the fact he was trying to be secretive. It just meant that, hey, he's a busy man. Jesus himself, everywhere he went, he was mobbed. So the fact that Jesus went out in the daylight, people were surrounding him. Nicodemus had obligations during the day, so it wasn't necessarily because Jesus was a controversial figure that they met at night. But I also would contend that both can be true also, right? Both, both ideas can be true at the same time. So that's a little fun fact for the day, that they met at night when it was cool because AC is a gift from God, amen? Amen. So when he says, this man came by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So right away, Nicodemus is already recognizing who Jesus is. And he's kind of complimenting him in a way. He's kind of like, oh, you are such a great man. He's, he's saying these things to kind of, kind of put Jesus up on this pedestal. And I, I love Jesus's response, which we're going to get to in a second. But isn't it interesting He's heard of Jesus. He's a busy man. The Pharisees have already made up their minds that Jesus is a problem. 
but yet Nicodemus can't help himself. He is drawn to the Lord. He cuts out an evening of his very busy day during a very busy season of a holiday, and he made sure that he got face to face with our Lord, right? So this shows you right away, there's something in his spirit that already knew that Jesus was who he says he was. And so he was drawn to him, much like us, right? We already, we already recognize day in and day out who our Savior is and why we draw breath and why everything is beautiful. But it wasn't so plainly clear for them back then. But Nicodemus understood right away. He may, he may not have been able to articulate it, but he knew, I got to see this guy. I have to talk to this guy. I'm hearing a lot of things about this guy, but I have to be in his presence. We see this earlier uh, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 through 22, when Jesus converses with a rich young ruler. By the way, excellent Christian rap name, if you're ever thinking about doing that, rich young ruler. I love it. Um, he too was drawn to Jesus. And remember, he asked the deeper questions. You know, I do this, I tie, da, 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 how can I? And he says, Jesus says, hey, pursue me, sell all your possessions and go. And uh, this wasn't what he wanted to hear, but just like Nicodemus, the rich young ruler was drawn to Jesus. He was drawn to him, and that's how we all find our Lord. You know, we're lost. You know, I called the Lord, and he, well, I sought the Lord, and he answered. That's the same thing we were singing this morning. A lot of us were lost, and we were just drawn to him. Maybe we weren't looking for him. I know I wasn't. I wasn't looking for him at all. Yet in his mercy and his grace, he found me. And so everybody's at different places in their walk, but the one thing that's resonating true for everyone is that our, our Lord answers the call whether we're ready for it or not, whether we're looking for him or not, and he's going to encounter you in a unique way that's going to speak just to you, just to your soul. And so this right here is an example of that. Yeah. And so when he said he recognized Jesus' divine authority, the Pharisees did not recognize that, but he did. And then here we go. Let's get to the meat of it. So verses 3 through 7, when we're talking about being born again, now, when Nicodemus, when Jesus says, and truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus's response was like, born again? Like, how can I crawl into my mother's womb a second time? God bless you. How can I crawl in my mother's womb a second time? Listen, Nicodemus's response in there wasn't, he wasn't coming from a place of, of, of like being insulting. He truly didn't understand Okay, so he wasn't taking a cheap shot at Jesus like he didn't have a flippant attitude like, oh, how am I supposed to get back in my mother? What do you mean? She's gone. Right. You're like, no, no, no. I'm trying to explain something deeper to you. You're, you're looking at things from a physical sense. I'm talking about the spiritual things. I'm talking about the things of God. Right. To be born again is not like a physical birth. Right. Both are messy, but they're totally, totally different. So Jesus shattered Nicodemus' Jewish assumption that their racial identity, being from the line of Abraham, is what was going to save them. He told them no, right? Because remember, Jews and Gentiles alike were all welcome to the kingdom of God. And this is what causes conflict in the new church post-Acts. You have, you have the word of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. Through grace and redemption, we are saved. Then you have people coming in trying to taint that with bringing in old customs and laws into the picture, which causes conflicts. And so Jesus is telling Nicodemus in this moment that don't assume just because you're from the line of Abraham that you're good, right? Much like in water baptism at a, as an infant stage, just because you're water baptized as an infant, that wasn't necessarily your choice. So a lot of people operate under the assumption that just because you're baptized as an infant that you're good. Don't worry. Go crazy. Live a sinful life. Remember, you were baptized when you were six months old. It's not true. That's not true. Show me that in scripture and I'll, I'll accept it. Again, is translated from the Greek word enothen, which means from above. So when we say born again, we understand the concept of being having a second birth. But Jesus also, when it's translated into the Greek, it's saying being born from above. So we are born here on this earth in this sinful place, this fallen world. But to be born again means to truly have a new identity from above above, having heavenly mindset, having a, have a heavenly thought pattern, have a heavenly existence, right? Following the Lord's example and his lead. So he cut right through the flattery again. Oh, surely you're from the Lord. If you're doing all these amazing things. And Jesus said, wonderful. 
and he got right to it, he didn't fall for the trap of flattery, right? He didn't let Nicodemus puff him up and go, and Jesus was like, I know, I know, thank you, peasant. No, he was like, listen, man, fantastic. You got to be born again. He got right to the chase, right? He's like, enough of all that. We're having this moment. Time is linear. I'm only here for a period. I don't have time to sit here and get your praises. I'm trying to communicate something to you that is going to benefit you. It's going to rock your world, and I need you to receive it. I need you to receive it. And this is that urgent message that the church has today. Listen, brothers and sisters, and I know we've all been touched by this. Tomorrow is not promised today. The Lord calls us home. We all have a shelf life. We all have a timeline. Some of us get 100 years, praise God. Some of us get much, much less. We always say, oh, tomorrow, oh, tomorrow, I'll go to church next week. I'll do this then. I'll do this, that. The Bible tells us not to do that. How arrogant can you flaunt in front of God and say, oh, I have all this time. You're not guaranteed anything. And so Jesus understands this and he's saying, listen, great. You need to be born again. You need to get right right now. Right now is the time. There's no time like the present. It's today. Whether you receive what I'm saying to you or not is not upon me. It's upon you to receive it. The truth is the truth, no matter who says it or when you hear it. It is what it is. And so when he says this, what is a new birth? So I ask you, what is a new birth? What does a new birth look like? So we know a natural birth, again, it's messy, lots of fluids. I have four children. I stayed topside for most of them. I'm not going to lie, but hey, I understand what was going on down there. I want to know part of it, but I understand it's messy, it's painful, and there's a lot of stuff going on down there. A spiritual birth may not physically manifest in that way, but what's going on inside of us is no less painful, it's no less messy, and it's no less complicated. So a new birth is not physical, okay? You're physically going to be the same person you were yesterday or the same person you were before you were born again, physically. But inside, inside is where the change takes place. It's a divine change from the inside out. Now, the Bible talks later on about judgments, right? Remember, remove the plank from your eye before you talk about the speck in somebody else's. The same logic applies here. I cannot testify to you to the goodness of Jesus Christ unless I myself have my house in order. And so it's a process that we all have to go through. It's unique to each of us. But from the inside out, we are changed. A changed heart, everything goes from there when we receive the Lord. And so again, it is a painful process. And I've said this many times on this pulpit, and I'll probably say it many more times again. Pastor Mike, who pastored here for a while, when we were having a a board meeting one time, he said, I want to draw teeth on this thing. And we're like, why? He's like, because this thing bites. It bites. It hurts because then we understand who, when we finally get to get a glimpse of who God is and what our position in his kingdom is, and we understand what we've been through and what we've thought previously is not what the reality is, it hurts because then we have to repent and we have to start changing. And that's the beauty of God. He's like, listen, I'm here for the change. If you're broken, come in these doors. We don't judge you. We don't condemn you. We just ask you to walk with us as we lift you up and help you in this process. Amen, indeed. And by the way, it's a complete change. It's victory. A spiritual birth, a born-again birth is victory. It's victory over addiction. It's victory over sin. It's victory over everything pulling you away from God. It is finished, Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. If you receive that, if you believe that, it is finished. Everything that's plagued you in your life, every mistake that you've ever made, every day that you fall short, you are forgiven because you have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. To be born again is to understand that and to not let your past be your prison, but let it be your testimony. Let it be a light for somebody in a dark place. Let your hand reach out the same way the Lord's hand reached out for you and pull somebody out of that. That is what this means to be born again. It is victory. It is victory. And hold on to that. I'm getting emotional because it's just, I'm preaching to myself as I'm preaching to you. And I need this too. I need this too. Why is being born again necessary? Why? Why? Why can't I just say, yeah, Jesus, you're good. Carry on. You could, you could, 
But why is being born again absolutely necessary? Well, our nature requires it. What do you mean our nature requires it? Being born in sin, our human nature is sinful. Since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, we are born into sin. Our sin nature, our impulsiveness, our desires, all rooted in the flesh, are temporary. Everything that gives us pleasure on this earth is temporary. God's pleasure, God's euphoria is eternal. And what we experience here is only a snippet of what we will experience in heaven. Part of my testimony, how I found the Lord. I was struggling with alcohol. And the pleasures that it gave me, I thought were amazing. And then I had a Holy Spirit encounter. I wasn't seeking the Lord, but he found me. And he did something to me that alcohol could never touch. I experienced the glory of God and I felt something that I can never put words to. This is why I'm amazed when John had revelation, he was able to write down what he wrote down. Can you imagine trying to describe what you're seeing and like seeing things that you don't understand, but then trying to communicate to people who have zero understanding? And so our sin nature requires that we sacrifice our old ways. It requires that we are born again because when we are born again, all those ways go away. Number two, God's nature requires it. Remember, God cannot look upon sin. He is righteous. He is holy. We cannot come before him unless we are the same. And only through the redemption blood of Christ can we be made holy. You can never achieve holiness on your own. This is Nicodemus's problem. This was the Pharisees' problem. They were trying to live up to a standard of a law that they could never live up to. The Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law, they are given to us so that we can understand sin. We can no longer operate in ignorance. And this we can point to to say, man, I failed on that one. 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 Thank God for Jesus because I'd be condemned. And so this is what he's trying to communicate to Nicodemus. Man, you got to understand this. It's required. Third and last thing, the work of Christ on the cross required it. He said, I am the way. And a little bit later in scripture, when we, we, he referred to Moses and the serpent on the staff, this is what he's alluding to. Jesus on the cross requires it of us because our faith, everything we believe in is in his resurrection. Everything we believe in points to that moment. As brutal and awful as it must have been to behold for John and Mary and his mother Mary, as awful as that was, it was required. And it's required of us to believe and put our faith in those things. Whew. Y'all with me? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Oh, my goodness. I'm trying to hold it together, y'all. I'm trying to. Um, so I'm in verse 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into heaven. I underlined the word enter. Previously, I underlined the word see in verse 3. See, enter. Um, Water is referring to a physical birth. A lot of people read that and think water baptism, but it's referring to the physical birth from the womb of the mother. It's not a water baptism. Being born of the flesh comes first, obviously, right? You know, and our, and our, was it, is it, oh my goodness, my brain is blanking, but it's like, you know, the life, uh, pursuit of life, liberty, happiness, but first you have to have life before you can have liberty. You have to have life and liberty before you can have happiness, right? So like in these things, order is structure is what he's communicating here. First of all, you must be born physically. You must be born of water. If you're not born, how can you receive other things? Because you don't exist. So he's simply saying that. And then what he's saying is that is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The spirit comes alive in us. Our existence is made up of three planes or three levels. There's our spirit, there's our soul, and there's our body. Okay? The spirit is eternal. This is literally the, the breath of life that God breathed into Adam that animated him, right? That, made, that brought the clay, that brought everything to life. It's eternal. The spirit in us is eternal. That's what draws us to the Father. That's our connection point to the Father. Your soul, some people call it the mind, that is your uniqueness. That is your personality. That is your likes and dislikes. That's what makes you uh, a sports fan. That's what makes you really good at sewing. That's what makes you really good at baking. That's what makes you like the color blue, right? That's what makes you like country music. or Whatever it is, your flavor, your soul is your uniqueness. Those two things are eternal. Your body 
this fleshly meat suit, right? It's made to fail. This was made to fail, right? This is not going to, this is not going to hold up. This will fail. At some point or another, it's going to break down on you. And I use the analogy, and I hate to be so gruesome, but if you have identical twins, one passes away, one's alive. Well, in that moment, what's different about them? They both have lungs, they both have eyes, they both have arms, they both have ears. What's different is the spirit has left them. So the body remains until Jesus comes back and we get our glorified bodies. This thing is made to fail. So when we are born of flesh, when we are born of water, it is a physical birth into our sin nature, into this decaying thing that became decaying once the fall of man happened. But the other thing, to be born of the spirit, now we're talking about the deeper things. Now we're talking about the eternal aspect of our existence and our uniqueness, our soul. And so when the spirit comes alive in us and begins to rule from within us, we are activated. My pastor Nick says it, I've never coached a kid to be tackled on the sidelines. Attacks and tests and trials will come your way as soon as you get activated. But when you get activated, you're going to know and you're going to have full faith and confidence in the Lord that he's never going to bring you to a task he can't pull you through. You may not see it. You may not understand it. But if he puts you there, he will equip you and pull you through it. So it comes from within. It's a total mind and culture shift from within us. Again, it's a process. It's a process. It's a process. And it's different for every single person. The word of God, energized and empowered by the spirit of God, speaks to our dark and formless, empty lives, just like he spoke to the earth in Genesis 1, chapter 2. A dark, formless void. He spoke everything into existence, right? We are dark and formless without him. We are shiftless. We fall for anything. When he speaks over us in the spirit, we now have purpose. We now have function. We now have a way to walk and pursue him in the design that he created us for, right? You may think you've been put here for a reason, but God may say, sweet, I'm going to use that for something else. When I wasn't saved, I thought my gifting was teaching, which it is. I taught, and I still do, middle school and high school kids in literacy and history. That's why I kind of fumbled on the you know, life, liberty, and happiness. My brain is whatever. Anyway, I thought that my gift was to educate children and how to make, make them eloquent writers or to learn more about our history. But God said, little bit. And once I was saved, he put the teaching of the word in me. And now, now I'm operating in a place that I know this is what I was formed to be. And so when the change comes from within, when he's calling you to these places, you have to understand that your idea of reality is up for debate when it comes to Jesus Christ. Whew. You are a birth, a new creation when the spirit takes over. Everything changes from the inside out. Everything changes. And I've just said a lot. And all of this is what Jesus is communicating in these milliseconds of time as he's conversating with Nicodemus. And again, Nicodemus knows this. Remember Saul, who became Paul, was also a member of, of the Pharisees. And they both had intimate knowledge of Scripture. And so when Jesus is saying this, you must be born again. Here's what this is. Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about? How can I go back in? And Jesus is like, dude, okay. <laughs> you got to be born of the water and of the spirit. And, and, and Nicodemus is probably processing and questioning and receiving, even though his flesh fallen mindset is at war with what he's hearing. But something in his spirit is saying, yeah, this is right. This is right. And there's a conflict in him. If you ever watch the show, The Chosen, they kind of spin his character where Jesus is about to leave and Nicodemus almost makes it. Who knows if that was true or not, but it shows you in that moment. I think that was a beautiful picture of maybe what was happening internally for Nicodemus when he was having this conversation with Jesus. He's torn. His flesh and his spirit are at war. Man, this makes sense. It doesn't make sense, but it makes complete sense. You ever, ever felt like that before? I know I do. Let's look at verse 10. And Jesus answered and said to him, are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Right, Jesus is basically calling him out. He's saying, I'm telling you scripture. I'm telling you things that have been prophesied. I'm telling you things that you already know. 
and you don't understand what I'm saying to you? How can you not comprehend this? How does your mind not recognize what I'm saying is to be true? Now, Jesus understands why, but he's still challenging Nicodemus. He's like, you're a teacher of teachers, and you don't understand what I'm saying? How can this be? Right? And so, again, He's telling these things in Nicodemus because he's challenging him. He's making him understand because one thing the Lord will do to us, once this, and this, by the way, this is all Holy Spirit, so bear with me. I didn't plan this out. But the one thing the Lord constantly shows us, especially as we pursue him in the spirit, is that we are going to be constantly broken down. Our pride is going to constantly be challenged. Our pride is going to constantly be broken down. God is after humble hearts. We cannot be so puffed up in our own knowledge that we seek other things and signs and, 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 and messages of interpretation in the simple things. Some of us will get a flat tire on a Tuesday. What's today's date? Is today the 11th? So let's say Tuesday will be what, the 13th? So if we get a flat tire on Tuesday at 10 a.m., there are some people that will look at that and say, wait, it's 10, 11 in the afternoon. It was my front left tire that went flat. And today's Tuesday... August the 13th. So those numbers mean this. And by the, and the fact that I'm on the west side of town and I'm wearing the color blue, God, like, okay, let's, let's, let's all calm down. What I'm saying is I fully believe, I fully believe as a man of God that he can communicate to people in ways like that. God can absolutely communicate through numbers. God can absolutely communicate through any means he needs necessary. But what I'm saying to you is, Do not get so caught up in all the things that you miss the simple things. Sometimes you got a flat tire because you got a flat tire and maybe the guy that's going to come help you change it needs to hear the gospel. Sometimes it happened on a Tuesday because you spent the entire Monday at home. Okay, so Nicodemus is one of those nitpicky people because he is a Pharisee. And so that's his job is to nitpick the law and find little things here, which by the way, are absolutely possible. Again, I'm not knocking that. It's absolutely possible. But what I'm saying is God can also be very simple, very straightforward. Just receive what I'm telling you. And if you find deeper meaning in what I'm telling you and and it increases your faith, awesome. But don't get so caught up in the forest that you miss the trees, right? And this is what he's trying to communicate. You're a teacher of teachers. You know scripture. And I'm telling you these simple things. And you're trying to find, but, 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 dude, I'm telling you, I'm showing you, I'm in front of you. Look at me. Sometimes the simplest answer is the best one, right? Amen. 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 (laughs) All right. I'm just losing all kinds of stuff over here. Gravity is a law. It's not a theory. (laughs) Nobody caught that. That's okay. Now, um, I know you did. All right. So, (laughs) So when Jesus says to him, no one has ascended to heaven, but he has come down from heaven. Again, he's alluding to himself. And so he's saying, I'm telling you heavenly things because I have come down from heaven. You look to heaven through scripture, but what I'm telling you is I have, I I am there. I'm from there. So when I tell you these things, trust that I'm the most accurate source of information that you possibly can have. And who who came down from heaven is the son of man who is in heaven. And here we go. Verse 14. This is what I was talking about a few minutes ago. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up. We have the beautiful gift of the Bible to show us an illustration of time from the beginning of all beginnings to the ministry of Jesus Christ, to acts in the early church, to revelation at the end. So we have, again, an entire scope in view, whereas people in the Bible are only given pieces at a time. And when Jesus spoke, He spoke in parables and he spoke in in manners in which that only people, as he said it, who have ears to hear can receive. Because remember, unfortunately, brothers and sisters, all will hear the word, but not all will receive it. 
okay? And so when he's speaking of these things, he is alluding to Moses in the Old Testament. Now, for those that don't know, I think it's in Numbers. Let me look. Yeah, Numbers 21, the Israelite people were being really bad. And God rendered a punishment upon them. He sent down snakes and serpents, fiery serpents. And people were being bitten and they were getting super ill and a lot of them were dying. And this was God punishing them for their sin. And so all the Israelites went to Moses and they said, hey, please, we messed up. Moses, can you please ask God to forgive us and to take this away? And so Moses said, all right. And he goes to God and God said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a serpent out of bronze and I want you to put it on a pole and I want you to stick it in the middle of the town. So all who are bitten, if they look upon this pole and this serpent on the pole, they will be healed. So Moses did what he was commanded to do. He made this bronze serpent, he put it on a pole, he stuck it in the middle of the town and sure enough, if somebody was bitten, they looked in faith at that pole, pick up on that, and they were healed, okay? So it's a picture, right? This is, this is also, by the way, for those that don't know, if you've ever seen an ambulance go by or seen anybody in medicine, this is the basis of that symbol that they use in modern medicine. You'll see a staff with a snake around it. That's where that comes from, mostly. And a lot of people allude to the Greek aspect of it too. I'm just going to subscribe to this one. That's just my personal viewpoint. I'm going to have those uh, Central Park horse blinders on. Um, and also too, just for you, uh, for your deeper understanding, uh, brass in scripture is always a metal of symbolic of judgment. So it's a metal used for judgment in the Bible. And the serpent is always symbolic of sin. So the fact that the serpent represents sin and it's made of brass shows that God's judgment over mankind was rendered and it was good. And so that's one of those deeper meanings I was telling you. So it's okay. Sometimes it wasn't just a serpent on a staff. In this case, the brass and the serpent did have a deeper meaning. So there you go. Um, it's an Old Testament picture of God looking upon the sins of man and rendering judgment. And by looking upon the pole, they were healed. Jesus in this moment with Nicodemus was pointing to himself until the Son of Man is lifted up. He's referring to the, to the crucifixion on the cross. Again, nobody knew this was coming. Jesus did. So he's saying these things because Jesus loved that. He loved to say stuff, especially to the apostles. And then after his crucifixion and resurrection, they were like, oh my gosh, that's what he was talking about. I get it now. Man, like I already believed, but now I really believe. Has that ever happened to you? It happens to me a lot. I put my faith in a lot of things. And I'm like, I don't know, this doesn't make sense, but I believe it because God, I believe you are true. And God has blessed that later. And I find things out and I, through revelation, through conversation, through study, through prayer, through worship. And then boom, later on, a week later, a month later, a year later, he shows me something. I'm like, oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. And so this is for Nicodemus because Nicodemus, again, he knows the Pharisees are after him, but we don't know. Well, we do, but they didn't know what was coming. Really, they didn't. So when he says, hey, lift it on the cross, it's coming. And this is the picture again of Jesus dying for the sins of mankind, being judged, the full wrath of sin being poured out on Jesus for us, for all mankind, past, present, and future, right? From Adam to the very last person that ever draws breath on this earth, currently forgiven. Believers and unbelievers. We just have to receive it. Now, let's get to the famous verse, verse 316. And I title this in my notes, thanks, Tim Tebow, right? Because uh, he notoriously, not notoriously, he, he uh, that's a bad word to put on that. But he, uh, what was it? Famously. Thank you. He famously put it on his eye, eye black, John 3.16. And like some of you, um, not a Gator fan, but obviously you couldn't escape Tim Tebow when he was at Florida. You couldn't escape him. He was everywhere. Um, John 3.16, I was hanging out with my buddies, watching football, drinking, obviously. None of us saved. And when we saw that, I guess my buddy went into a back room, blew the dust off his Bible, and flipped over to John 3.16. And honestly, can I be honest with you guys? I didn't know what that, like, I knew it was in the Bible, but the 3.16 meant nothing. When I was first saved, I went to my wife, and I was like, I need to learn how to read the Bible. And she says, okay, do you know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? And I said, what's that? This shows you where I was, okay? And so my friend blew it up and, 
and you read the verse out loud to us. There's like 10 of us in the room. We've been drinking for like five hours. Well, we all sat there in silence like, what does that mean? But here it is. And so let's read it out loud together. That, okay, okay, real quick. That right there is a Kairos moment. That right there is being obedient to the Spirit. That right there, my friend, who probably hadn't opened that Bible in Lord knows how many years, did that. That is an act of faith. That, my friends, can be considered a miracle. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Thank you all for saying that with me. In that one verse, 20-something words, however many words there are in there, Jesus is in the most simplistic form communicating an aspect of God's love, mercy, and the redemption. You can break that verse down into three parts, three sections, what he's communicating. First of all, he's communicating God's heart, right? For he so loved the world, the, far, the heart of a father. Second way, Jesus is communicating God's plan, right? That he gave his only begotten son. And thirdly, he's communicating God's will that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again, Jesus is communicating God's heart, God's plan, and God's will. That's a whole sermon in one verse. Amen? All right. And this is the good news for us, everybody. Let's jump to 17. Praise God. Thank you for not coming to condemn us. We're already condemned. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Brothers, sisters, we're already condemned. It's already been done. There's nothing that you have done that's going to make you more condemned than you already were at birth. If that's shocking, let that marinate for a moment. <laughs> Digest it. It's true. That's why Jesus came to save us. He's like, I don't need to do anything. Y'all already messed up, right? You guys are already in trouble. I don't need to point my finger at you and accusingly point to you and put you down. No, he came to reach out. He came to say, I love you. I forgive you. Come here. Without me, you're not going to make it. Come Get over here. That's beautiful. Like, when you, if you fully, fully give that weight, the creator of all things, it was our mess. It was our disobedience. It's our sin. As many times as we've turned from God, if you look at the Old Testament, time after time, like Cindy Lauper, right? We've turned away from him. And time after time, he's shown up. And finally, God said, I got to get down there. They're never going to make it. They're never going to make it unless I jump in. He is the way. He is the only way. And all he asks is for you to receive it. Oh my goodness, Lord. Jesus came down to reach out to the people and to embrace them. Not to point his finger and come down on them. And the unique thing about our Lord, as I said a second ago, is that while others in different religions are telling us what we must do to reach heaven, Here's what you have to do to attain the gift and to attain the, the reward of eternity. Here's what you have to do. Our God, our God said, no, 
I'm going to pull you up to me. There's nothing that you're going to do beyond your submission to me that's going to get you up here. And guess what? You don't have to. We operate in the faith of grace. Works come as a byproduct of grace. What I'm saying to you is if you are fully alive, if you are fully born again, if Jesus has truly changed your heart, if you have truly turned from your old ways and you are in a new walking person mode, you are going to have works. It's going to be organic. Much like we talked about the tongues, the filling of the spirit, it overflows at manifesting giftings. Same for you. Once the spirit fills you up and you have an empty cup, if I pour water into an empty cup, what's going to happen if I keep pouring it? The water is going to overflow. That is where works happen. Not through obligation, not because you feel guilty if you don't, not for the praise of your brothers and sisters. That's why the Bible says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing because it is an organic, natural occurrence when God is doing something in your life. Amen. So he's saying, I love you. I forgive you. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. Right? If you ever get lost in the woods, what do survival people tell you? Stay put. If you ever get lost in the woods, don't move. If you're a moving target, you're harder to hit. Stay still. The rescue teams will find you. God is saying the same thing. Stay still. I'm coming for you. And when I come for you, I'm going to activate you, and you're going to go, and you're going to pursue a path you never thought were possible. Period. Works are going to come out of you through me, for my glory, and you are going to be blessed by it. You are going to be blessed by the works I do through you. Glory be to me, but how wonderful that I can use you. How wonderful that I chose you. And again, being obedient and operating looks different. There is no, oh, my works are better than yours and I'm more glorified than you. No, if you're doing something out of obedience, even if it's just waving at somebody and saying, hi, God bless you. That's beautiful. Works look different. Amen? Amen. Let's go. Uh, I'm going to invite the worship team. Come on back up here. Speaking of anointing and beautiful things, our brothers and sisters on the worship team. Verses 18 through 21. Walking in the light. Why don't people come into the light is the title I put over this little section. Why don't people come into the light? Why are there people that are lost? Why are there people like Nicodemus that are so puffed up in their own knowledge that they just can't see the simple things? Why? Where are my guys at? What are my, what's my favorite phrases? I don't know. God reigns. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I trust that God has a plan. But why don't people come into the light? Because it says it right here. Verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son. 19. As this is condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. There's your answer. Men and women, we love darkness rather than light. Why is that? It's our fallen nature. It's the flesh. This is why one must be born of the spirit. Deeper things. Our flesh craves it. People don't want to change sometimes. I didn't want to change. I didn't, but I did. What was it, Pastor Nick, in the end when uh, Moses went to the Pharaoh and talked about the frogs? He says, hey, get these frogs out of here. And he's like, all right, you want them out right now? And the Pharaoh said, tomorrow, right? Let me, let me mire in my sin one more night. Tomorrow we can do this. And what would we say at the beginning of this sermon? What's not promised? When's it time to get right with God? Amen. People crave the darkness because there is no light in them because they want to. Pursuing God is an active choice. The born again nature is an active choice. God presents us with choices. He will always give us a way out. 
If the enemy presents you with temptation and sin, God will always provide you a way out. But he leaves the choice up to you. When people who do not believe press us on our faith, they love to mention things like Cain's wife or Jonah in the belly of the fish or the immaculate conception or evolution. And this is based on their own philosophies, intellectual struggles on spiritual matters. So a lot of people, again, that can't see the forest from the trees are going to be so puffed up in their own knowledge, kind of like Nicodemus in scripture, that they can't see the simple things. Somebody in my family that I love very much is one of the most intelligent men that I know. But he is so smart that he's stupid. And I say that in love. And so when we communicate the deeper things of God, when we communicate the spiritual aspect of God, when we communicate what it means to be born again, what it means to be born in the spirit, sometimes their brains can't comprehend that because they love the darkness so much. They love the knowledge that they've acquired. They love that their safety in their sin is, is protected by the fact that they don't believe. And they love that more than humbling themselves and receiving the truth that is Jesus Christ. You're going to encounter that if you already haven't. Pray for them. But remember, do not cast your pearls to swine. They will trample on them. You will have a moment, hopefully, when you can speak into their lives. But you may encounter people like this all the time, and you're like, man, if they just knew, if they just could get out of their own way, if they just could close some of these philosophy books and open up the Bible and open their eyes, they'll see the evidence is all around us. But they don't. And it's sad. And it can be heartbreaking if it's somebody you love. Just pray for them. Again, I'm up here now because I married a praying woman. Amen. For three years, she went to war for me. She's outside right now <laughs> with the kids. But she went to war for me. And God showed up when I wasn't looking. There is hope. There is hope. Don't give up. There was hope for Nicodemus, and who knows how his story ends. We know we see him again later, but I'm going to close with this. I'm going to let you guys do your thing. So what did we learn today? Well, we know that like Nicodemus, we're all drawn to Jesus. Some of us have faith that he is our redeemer, sent to purchase us with his blood on the cross. And to others, He's a semi-mythical figure that stands in the way of social progress <laughs> in 2024. I got hit with that on Facebook one day. If you Christians would just get out of the way of social progress, this world would be a lot more peaceful. Okay. If God's plan and God's will, it was, excuse me, God's plan and God's will that Jesus came, came to teach us what it is to be born again by the Spirit, we must first choose him and place our faith in the work of the cross and be changed from the inside out. But if one continually chooses darkness over light and rejects Jesus, this person will instead receive the judgment that is due. But for us, we receive the free gift that is Jesus' death satisfied God completely for the sin of all humanity. So brothers and sisters, I just pray over you right now. Lord, I pray that everything that I communicated from this pulpit be accurate and true. Father God, I pray that you do a work. Father God, I pray that seeds were planted. Father God, I pray that seeds are watered. Father God, I pray that you cultivate those seeds in your time, in your season. Father God, I pray that everyone in this congregation be blessed. Father, I pray that they all have an opportunity today to be a light in someone's darkness. Father God, I pray that everyone in this congregation be led by the Spirit, even when it doesn't make sense. And Father God, I just pray your covering over every single one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.